Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is a very special segment of Unreal Build Virtual Production. Robert Zemeckis is one of our era's most iconic filmmakers. Millions of people of all ages have been touched by his film, such as Back to the Future, Forrest Gump, Death Becomes Her, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Cast Away, to more recently, The Polar Express, Christmas Carol, The Walk, Welcome to Marwin, and his latest movie, The Witches, that was just released last month. In total, the movies he directed generated $4.5 billion at the worldwide box office. Throughout his career, Robert Zemeckis has been a visual effects pioneer who constantly found new and exciting ways to use visual effects to tell stories. In Back to the Future, we remember Marty McFly racing toward the clock tower just as the lightning strikes, or Forrest Gump weaving his way through some of the most significant events in American history. It is on that strong visual effects foundation that he and his team at Image Movers Digital developed what became virtual production. Today, Robert Zemeckis is joined by his longtime visual effects supervisor, Kevin Bailey, who has his own impressive resume, dating back to his time at Lucasfilm as a previous artist on Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. Kevin worked on the Harry Potter, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Transformers franchises, and he has been Robert Zemeckis' frequent collaborator, dating back to A Christmas Carol in 2009. Together, they have pushed the limits of visual effects and virtual production, not being afraid to get hands-on or take risks to move the art of filmmaking forward. So I'm very excited to welcome these two industry icons to talk about how they used virtual production over the years, how it impacted production of the witches, and where they see virtual production taking us in the future. Please welcome Robert Zemeckis and Kevin Bailey. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you for joining us today at Unreal Build Virtual Production. It's really great to have you. So I want to get straight to the heart of the matter um, because we don't have much time and there's so much to, to talk about. And this is an event about virtual production. So I want to recognize the pioneering role that you have played, Robert Zemeckis, in the inception of virtual production at the very beginning of the field when you did Polar Express, Beowulf, Christmas Carol. So many people came out of the team that you built at that time and are now the top people working in virtual production today and they learn from you. Can you tell us when there was none of that, how you came to make those movies? What was your motivation to create this whole new set of tools and techniques that were virtual production? Well, I guess it's a, a, a two-part answer. I've always been a fan of the new tools of cinema when, they're, when they arrive, right? I've never shied away from trying to figure out a way to use something that's a new innovation. Um, back in the day when we did uh, movies where everything was optical, I actually commissioned um, things to be built, you know, like uh, motion control dollies and things like that, because they didn't exist there. You know, the thing that's interesting about the movie industry is that there's no research and development. It all happens when a movie, the necessity of a movie creates a reason to build a new tool. So I'm, I'm always looking for these new tools and how, you know, they could help, um, help make movies look more interesting. Um, but then the second part of the answer is it's always a selfish reason. Um, as I'm always looking for a control and, um, you know, the thing that was always the most heartbreaking, you know, making movies back in the day when everything was in the camera was, you got your dailies back and they didn't look exactly like you thought they were going to look. Um, the things, you know, you were kind of at the mercy of the camera operators and the focus pullers. And, and of course, uh, you know, the actors as well, except you were able to watch their performance, but many times, you know, the camera operator would say, yeah, we got it. And then you'd see the shot with your favorite performance and, you know, they topped the actor or something, you know, there's say, or they, or the camera moved or it was flawed in some way. So as these tools developed, um, you know, any, any, so any way that I could use the virtual cinema to give myself as much of a, of an escape from what I call the tyranny of production, um, I would use those tools. And so I embraced it a lot because it gave me control over basically the entire part of physical filmmaking and the only thing but it kept it kept the magic of what the performer would do so um 
it was for me, it was a perfect blend of the two things. And also the other thing is that once you were able to uh, performance capture an actor, you always had that performance, right? So many times in, 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 when I was making a movie um, in the camera, uh, I would, the actor would do something wonderful on a specific take. And then I would always, you know, my heart would sink because I would always worry about then having the camera assistant say, ah, you know, they didn't hit their mark perfectly. So it's not completely in focus. And then of course you can never get that performance back. So to me, it was a way to, you know, actually have the best, the best of both worlds in the, in the world of filmmaking or cinema. Well, you certainly did amazing work and you inspired a lot of us um, at the big games to this day. Uh, to get in and, and develop the next generation of tools. Um, I want to show you something I found in my, in my archive. Um, I'm known as the guy who goes around with the epic pin, but I found this in my uh, collection. So I'm going to do the next rest of the interview with uh, my IMD pin, Image Mover Digital. And we have an image also of, of the people that were there on your motion cool. capture stage at the time. So can you talk about the milestone that led you after the IMD phase and how you've transferred those, those techniques into your live action movies that you have done with Kevin in the last uh, 10 years. Kevin and I started working together on the Christmas Carol. That was a completely virtual movie. And I had made two completely virtual movies before that. One was the uh, Polar Express and Beowulf. The next film we did was, well, it was, right. it was right. a, Live action movie, which was flight. Right? It had a bunch of visual effects in it, and then after that, we did the, the the walk, which was our sort of first combination of using, you know, all the virtual tools combined with a live action performance. Because I don't think we had any digital characters in that at all. And then we evolved all the way to Welcome to Marwin, and you know, that's where we had a combination of live action and digital characters, but all performed by the same actors, which is kind of like you know, the culmination of where this art form was going or this technique was going. That's great. And Kevin, you have some illustration of the evolution there of the work that was done, I think, um, on some of those movies. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's, it's sort of interesting to mention that when people say virtual production these days, like a lot of that, that term means different things every year, um, it seems like. And like, you know, the, the definition du jour is these LED walls that you you know, project a final image up onto, but, you know, there's, in my mind, there's a lot of different parts of virtual production and they, they've kind of, they're all accumulating into that methodology, but, you know, we'd had the good fortune of, of just by the virtue of Bob wanting to push sort of storytelling and, and using narratives that are, that are sort of hard to achieve without visual effects. Um, you know, a movie like The Walk was one of the first movies to really leverage simulcam in a big way um, where we had this massive green screen void that our tightrope walker and or Joseph Gordon-Levitt were in. And, you know, it's like, how, how do you look at a frame like this and know what you're shooting, right? I mean, it's just a massive void of, of green with a, a corner of a building. Um, so what we ended up doing is, is you know, bringing this simulcam uh, tech to set and being able to see our horizon lines and, and compose the buildings in a way that was uh, a lot more like the natural filmmaking process. And, you know, then you look at, you know, a movie like Allied, which um, was shot in 2015. And that was one of the first movies. We had all this car work that we needed to do, but it was all sort of in these desert environments and, and remote towns you know, Bob was like, it, it would be crazy for us to bring cars to these locations and spend all this time and none of the audio is going to be usable. And, you know, there's all kinds of bad stuff with that. Um, so we were kind of inspired by the gravity LED box that they shot that footage in. And we're one of the first productions to actually use LED walls um, that we put, we didn't put all digital footage on it, but we put footage from a camera array that we shot off of cars and augmented it you know, we would get reflections and moving lighting on Brad Pitt and Marianne Cotillard as they were in the car. Um, but if a background, you know, wasn't going to be usable in camera, we would put blue in the camera frustum and make it so we were actually had a virtual blue screen there. Um, so we were able to kind of like find ways of using the tech, which sort of everybody's doing now five years later, 
Um, but at the time it was really exciting because there was no real blueprint uh, for, for how to do that. And, you know, then like Bob said, Welcome to Marwin was just, you know, it was the kitchen sink. It was accumulation of all that stuff where we, because of the fact that the methodology of the production was we're filming the actors in mocap suits using their faces, their real faces as source imagery for these dolls, the lighting on their faces had to be spot on with what the final shot was going to be. And if we didn't know what the shot was going to be lit like at the end of the day, how are we going to get this live action footage of their faces, right? So we ended up having to make tools so that Bob and our, our DP could pre-light every scene in the movie. So we knew when we got there on the day what these scenes were going to be lit like. And we did all that in Unreal. And then on the day, we had one screen that had the scene in Unreal and one screen that had the actors and making sure that the lighting is matching, that the composition was what we liked. So it was sort of performance capture, simulcam, real-time lighting, hugely the kitchen sink, and that kind of, you know, brings us to, to today. And can you talk, Mr. Zemeckis, about what were the benefit to see a real-time feedback and, and the improvement in quality that you see on set to, to what degree it helps you in the filmmaking process? Yeah, you know, as much as, as, much as information as you can get on the set, um, it's always good because it helps everybody What I like about having these tools at my disposal is what Kevin was saying, like when we're doing a film like Allied, for example, where you don't have to go at all out into the Sahara Desert and, and try to do a scene that's an intimate scene and, um, and then have all this equipment. And then, you know, the light keeps changing, the sun keeps moving, the wind comes in. You know, anytime that you can not be in the natural elements of weather and light um, and you can bring this stuff back into the stage that to me gives the director, you know, for me, I like, I love having that control because I can just focus on, on my actors and their performance and not have to worry about how I'm going to, you know, cover the scene because, you know, a storm front is moving in. I find it, it, it you know, a wonderful irony is that, Back in the, in the early days of the cinema, they had to do everything on um, stages because the equipment was so bulky and it was impossible to put in real locations. And then, of course, everything became much more portable and we, and we could shoot everything, you know, a anywhere we wanted. But now we have these virtual tools, which is, allows us to bring everything back inside again so we can have more control, but it looks perfectly, you know, photo real and no one can even tell that we're not we're not outside or not on the Sahara Desert so for me I love it because the thing I love about cinema is it's all illusion and you know anytime I can create an illusion that you know tricks the audience I'm all in on that and I think that that's like one of the genius things about virtual production is is that it allows us all to get the Um, all like as many of the bad ideas out of the way in the very beginning of the process. Like I have so many bad ideas when it comes to like the beginning of how we shoot, because that's like the safe space to like, let's just th throw a bunch of stuff out and see what sticks. That's kind of why I think we, I certainly love pushing the virtual production on a Bob show. because um, Bob, you'll, you'll often tell me, it's like, I don't need previous for this scene. I don't need it. It's just whatever you guys need. <laughs> and, and I think that's a great way of putting it is because, you know, you, you've got it all in your head. And I think it's, it's an amazing tool for everybody else to understand, um, what, what's in there. And then also like, I see so much riffing off of like, oh, Hey, we see the setup. And then all of a sudden it's like another great idea comes out. It, it's, it's like, finding all the happy accidents ahead of time in a way, um, which, is, which is really cool. That's great. I want to um, ask about um, The Witches. So that movie is fantastic. It's scary. It's a Halloween movie. When I got into it, you know, I did not expect the, the movie that was there. It's amazing. Um, can you talk about how um, you applied some of the the techniques in, in that particular movie and, and the inception of it and how, how did you come to, to do that movie? It, it was a perfect story to update using the new um, tools that we have in, in visual effects. I mean, um, when Nick Rogue made that movie back in the late 1980s, 
they had very few, very limited tools. Um, they had to use, you know, poor real mice that they had to like glue things on. And, and they had masks that were made from the Jim Henson. Um, so now, you know, we're, we had the tools to actually make mice that look actually real. And they can actually perform as if they were kids who were transformed. And the performances of the actual kid actors is what drove the animation for the moving mice. We had great artists and great technicians who could, you know, design these mice characters who, you know, acted and looked like real mice, but then had the personality and had the emotional characteristics of the actors. So we finally have the tools to actually, you know, present that movie in a way where, you know, the, the story can be, can be done on film in a way that has very few limitations. And that's because of it being, you know, of, of ne- we now have this, this virtual cinema that can basically make completely virtual images look 100% photo real. And that's where we are today in, in, in the world. So filmmakers can do anything that they want now. And they're only limited by their own imagination. And they can, they can create any environment. They can create any character, any creature, whatever they want to do. Camera move. It's all at their disposal. I have a quote from you. I'm not sure if it's from you. You'll be able to tell me if, if you, you were misquoted. From where I sit, I see the digital cinema creating a sloppiness on the part of filmmakers because they know they, if they really get in trouble, they can fix it later. So they don't pay that much attention. And of course, it costs a lot of money. Was that a quote from you or? Yeah, no, yeah I, said, I said something to that effect. I mean, I think that was, yeah. So everything's a trade-off, right? We have this ability to um, create these images and, and we have this ability to, to make films using these high-speed digital tools. Back in the day, if there was a microphone that dipped into the top of the frame, that shot was unusable, mm-hmm. right? And so you had to do another take, right, to protect yourself. Now, if that happens, you say, all right, let's move on because we'll paint it out right? Let's just move on. Well, you know, now you have a shot that could have been completely done in the, in the, in the camera. And now it becomes a visual effect shot. And it costs probably three times more money to paint that microphone out than it would have if you had just taken another 10 minutes and done the shot again. So that's where the disciplines of, you know, you know, of, of, of having done, you know, uh, complete in the camera production, have helped me because, you know, you have to make, you have to make these decisions, you know, in other words, deciding on the color of an actor's tie before you shoot the first, you know, day's work is what you, we, what you have to do as a director. Now you kind of don't know what the tie should be. I'll put any tie on them. And then later you have to say, you know, he really should be wearing a blood red tie, you know, and then you have to go and change every one of those shots and it costs a lot of money. But I think the reason that the reason that I said that quote was what I noticed in editing, the way films are edited now that we can do it digitally, is that a lot of films, there's editing where there's no need for editing. There's just cutting what I say, cutting for no reason. And I think it's like you just cut because you can, you know. And so I think that's a trade off. I think that, you know, you know, to be able to understand that you put a cut in the in the film. That's, that's like writing at that moment. You have to have a reason to put an edit in the film. I think that films, sort of the, the, art, the art form of, of editing has, has kind of gotten, um, I don't know what the word should be, it may be a bit uh, erratic um, because um, you can just do it. You know, you can, just, you, can, you can just cut. You can just cut, 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 cut. And I'm not quite sure that in a lot of films, if that if that's thought through. So anyway, the digital cinema is a, is a, is is a trade-off. There's, we got great tools, um, but you know they they can be used um, in a distracting way if we're not careful. Yeah, and I think that that's that's sort of you know one of the as visual effects becomes more prevalent, and this is going to be come the case even more as the real time aspect of production advances is. You know, people are, they, you know, famously using visual effects everywhere for no reason. And so that 
that laser focus on making sure that it's always a story driven choice that's being made, which was enforced back in the old day when visual effects were very scarce and expensive, that sort of discipline, it's, it's, it's a little bit more, <laughs> more rare to see that these days and, and, and will become more rare um, as the real time of it all sort of expands, um, which I think will, will be a great way of sort of teasing out the filmmakers who are exceptional. Um, the interesting thing hearing you talk, Bob, about making the choices on the day um, and visual effects kind of allowing us to sort of kick the can down the road. The interesting thing with these LED walls that everybody's you know really excited about these days is that they bring back a little bit of the immediacy of making the decision today, right? Because it's sort of like a lot of the virtual production that we've been focused on for the last 10 years has really been around you know, informing choices and whatever, but you're still shooting on a green screen or you're, we're, we're still shooting something that has a life in post so that we can make decisions in the context of the edit and whatnot. Whereas these LED walls, um, you know, to a large extent are putting people's feet to the fire to like make a choice today because to fix it later is really, really expensive, right? Um, so I don't know how that's going to change the model of, of filmmaking, but it's just, it's an interesting parallel that we're in a, in a way we're sort of going backwards to filmmaking as it was where, you know, you got to make sure your set's good before you shoot in it. Otherwise you're stuck. Yeah. But at least if you had the discipline to make that choice, you can get your scene. Yeah. That's the trade off. Yeah. It's remarkable actually to see, you know, even in um, like the, the virtual scout that we did today, Bob, you know, there were three people interacting behind the scenes in an unreal session with, the operator, Kristen, and, you know, they're all back behind the scenes, moving stuff around. And, and it, when you have notes changing it right then and there, and you could, you could see sort of an army uh, behind the scenes helping to support that, that workflow. So yeah, you, you kind of get all, all the creativity of the visual effects process today with all the immediacy of being on a real movie set. Um, and that's super exciting to me too. Yep, exactly. Exactly. That's amazing. I would like to come back to um, to the witches, and um, if you have some um, if some uh, aspect that you can show us, Kevin, about how you proceeded in in the movie itself to uh, to create uh, the the character, the mice, and what we were talking about. Yeah, so you know, in in the witches, a big part of that movie was the mice. I mean, halfway through the movie, you know, we end up with th uh, three characters that are children that have become mice, and you know, Bob was, he really said, hey, I want them to be, I want them to feel like kids, but not exactly like kids. We shouldn't mocap kids, but they shouldn't be mice uh, literally either because they're going to be too twitchy and erratic. They kind of need to feel like the soul of a kid and a mouse. And it really ended up being like the first sort of animated, truly animated character since Roger Rabbit that you've done, right, Bob? Well, yeah, it's sort of like the comp. You know, this is the this is the first uh, animated live action mix I've done since Roger Rabbit, and it was so much easier doing it with all the digital tools that we have. Um, and we did it the same way in production, where there were off camera performers doing the mouse voices on set, and the live action actors were looking at targets, and um, the but the performers were performing uh, right out of frame. A lot of the stuff that we pioneered on Roger, we did it on this, and but we used digital the, the digital tools that we have. Yeah, and part of that that made that so successful because a lot of movies. I mean, I got my start in in previs, and a lot of movies previs. Um, the the virtual camera tools, I think, are really what makes this so successful because what we can do is is you know, animate out entire scenes, just kind of from a God's eye view, the whole thing, we, we call it a, a, a sync check. And as soon as Bob's happy with it, we give him one of these virtual camera devices, which is, you know, on, on the witches was like basically a vibe puck on the, the end of a few handles that we could configure to make him comfortable to hold. And that was it. And, you know, as Bob moves that camera around, it, it, it moves a camera that's in Unreal. And, you know, we can just go in and lay out the, the perfect shot and the perfect scene, whether it's with humans or mice. And what we ended up with is an edit of pretty much every scene in the movie that had some virtual component of it. 
And it was from Bob's mind, not like some previous artist's mind or storyboard artist's mind. It was really just like, here's, here's the way in that moment um, that, that we, we all knew that was, this is how Bob sees the movie, you know, give or take. And that was really super, super helpful because it allowed us to figure out, I mean, there's scenes in this movie where we see the mice running around and half the shots in a scene are filmed plates with mice in them and half the shots in a scene are completely virtual. And we're cutting back and forth between virtual and live action. And the only way we could ever have planned that is if we had this, these layout cameras, these virtual cameras from Bob um, to figure out what was appropriate for what. So that, yeah, there was, there was a lot of advantage there to, to having that design work done. And it allows us, allowed us to create new devices, you know, to shoot with. Um, we created a mouse cam device that allowed us to run the camera on, along the floor at a high speed. And what it also did, this virtual camera process, is it allowed our DP, it allowed our AD to sort of like explore the sets as well before they were there on the day working with the Bob and the production designer to actually see what was going to be uh, a month before there was any set construction that happened. Right. So, you know, this is all just sort of like in the name of like developing context um, where we can all sit around a table as, as a filmmaking team and, you know, again, get all the bad ideas out of the way in the beginning and zero in on what the plan is for the day, just to make things so much efficient and just generally, you know, better. Yeah, the thing that's great, the thing that was great about the virtual camera and the ability for me to rough out a shot with my hands um, and put the lens on that I want was a big breakthrough. And that happened on Polar Express because um, the hardest thing for me to do in the virtual world when we first started making virtual films was to describe the camera operating to the layout guys because they came from like, I don't know, the gaming world or something because most of the shots that they would lay, lay out were like drone shots. And so I was, it was so hard to explain what I wanted a camera to look like. So being able to actually operate the camera myself in the, in the digital environment and rough the shot out and then the layout guys could clean it up was the big breakthrough. And as a matter of fact, what we did on, uh, at, at IMD was we put all of our um, our layout guys in camera operating school. Remember that, Kevin, where we had top-notch camera operators with an actual camera on a dolly, and we put out and we went out in the parking lot and and showed the virtual camera operators how a physical camera would move through the set and how it would move on on the axis because their tendency was, well, the camera can go anywhere, so. Let's move it anywhere we want, you know, um, which is beautiful, except that if you want your, your film to look like traditional cinema, you have to know those things that, all, that a camera can only do, like when you have to tilt up and boom down at the same time, right? And they had to learn those terms because that's what I'd say to them. They'd say, no, no, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta dolly left and pan right. And, and they go, what, 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 you know? And so anyway, so anyway, just being able to like do it visually, it was great to like, you know, be able to like rough those shots out. Yeah, I think it get, kind of gets to like, you know, before this interview, David, I know we were talking like, you're like, what's the definition of virtual production uh, in, in your guys' mind? And, you know, I, I think for, for me, based on <clears throat> everything that Bob and I have done together, you know, I've kind of zeroed in on a very broad definition of virtual production that doesn't ever change uh, year to year. And that definition is any tools that allow the director to interact with the digital process in the way that a director is used to interacting with the live action process. Whatever that is, is virtual production, whether it's LED walls or simulcam or anything. It's, it's the things that allow the director to interact with the digital process in the same way that he or she is used to working in the live action process. And that's really all these tools are, is just like getting getting that cinematic vision that's in Bob's mind onto the screen with as little guesswork and as little game of telephone as possible, just getting as close to touching the final pixel as, uh, as humanly possible. What is your definition of virtual production? 
not, nothing dramatic. I mean, virtual production is, is, um, is creating um, cinematic photo real images out of, out of digital information. You create a photo real image with nothing physical. You know, you, you have no, you have no, you're not bending any light through a lens um, at all. That's what it is for me. So it's being able to just completely, you know, create a movie using, for lack of a better word, a very elaborate keyboard. So maybe my definition of, is, is it's the closest thing we have right now to typing out a movie on a keyboard and having a finished photo real movie come out of the printer. All right. Well, that's a, that's a new definition. Well, we're not right there yet, but we're, we're working right. towards that, right? Or even from or the even, script or even to the image. Put some thing on the, on the filmmaker's head that can read his mind, his, you know, his brain waves, and then that comes out into a uh, finished movie. Yeah, we need uh, to get Elon Musk on the case. Yeah, get rid of, get rid of the keyboard part. We don't need that. You know, just get, get right to it, right? All right. That's amazing. I want to thank you very much for being with us today at Unreal Build Virtual Production. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, it was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.